Okay, thank you all for coming. So our talk is on how to migrate from Drupal 7 to 10 efficiently and cost effectively. My name is Anani Mansoor. I'm a technical architect at Debug Academy. I actually took Debug Academy's three month Drupal web development course back in 2015 and have been working as a Drupal developer ever since. I started at a digital agency called Beacon Fire Red, which is now Allegiance Group, and got to build Drupal sites for large nonprofit organizations. And now I'm back at Debug Academy leading some of the Drupal builds for our clients. Recently been doing a lot of migration projects, hence this talk. Uh, and I'm also an Acquia certified Drupal developer. Hello everyone, my name is Ashraf. Um, I founded Debug Academy a little over 10 years ago. Um, worked at, a, at Acquia as an architect for a few years as well. Um, got a lot of little badges here from Acquia certifications. Um, we teach Acquia certification courses at Debug Academy, um, so that's why I always go through those courses. So I've got Drupal 7 through 10. Um, if you're interested in becoming an Acquia certified developer, or becoming a Drupal developer. We've got a lot of courses out um, that we've prepared, we've refined, and we take a lot of pride in the quality of our courses and the effectiveness of them as well. Um, so we have our Become a Drupal Developer course. I have to play with my laser pointer over here. Um, we've got our Become a Drupal Developer course. It's a part-time course which spans about three months. And in that course, uh, you can uh, learn front-end development, Drupal fundamentals, and even a little bit of module development. Um, we've also got Acquia certification courses for those of you who may already be developers but are looking to get over that hurdle of passing the Acquia certification exams. Um, we also have the Drupal Architect series. If you've built a few Drupal sites yourself and you're looking to get to the next level, um, that's a good option as well. And of course, various other courses. We do custom team training and consulting also. Um, and a shout out to all the sponsors of Drupal GovCon. It's a wonderful event. You know, you compare it to something like DrupalCon, another event we love, which tickets could be you know seven hundred dollars for that. We get to attend this one for free. Um, so it's it's a testament to the volunteer-led organization, and again to all of these sponsors who. Um, sponsor the free lunches, the venue, and everything else. Okay, so I'm gonna start by discussing what Drupal 7's end of life means. So Drupal 7's end of life is coming up on January 5th, 2025, and this means Drupal 7 core will no longer receive security updates, bug fixes, enhancements, or any further core development. And because of this, uh, there are various risks to staying on Drupal 7 core past its end of life date. The first major risk is security because newly discovered security vulnerabilities will remain unpatched so your site can be at risk of being hacked. Uh, you may face compatibility issues because newer versions of PHP may not be compatible with Drupal 7. Um, and because there's a lack of official support for Drupal 7 core, um, any bugs that currently exist in Drupal 7 core are likely to persist. Um, when it comes to Drupal 7 modules and themes, uh, these may no longer be maintained or updated by their developers, so any bugs or secure, security vulnerabilities that they have may um, not get fixed in the future. Also, you may face compliance and legal risks, so by running an unsupported software version, uh, you could be in violation of data protection regulations like GDPR or HIPAA. Um, and if a security breach does occur because you're using an unsupported software version, um, then you can be legally liable. So because of all of these risks, you also may face increased maintenance costs because you may have to develop custom security patches and updates and you would develop that internally or by hiring external experts. So now that we know what the risks are, what are some options that you have? Uh, and I'm gonna start by discussing the easier and more budget-friendly options first and build my way up from there. Um, the first option is not a migration option, but it is technically an option that you have, which is to stay on Drupal 7. You get to keep your site as is, um, and it's the most affordable option in the short term. 
Um, but like I said in the previous slide, you may face maintenance costs later down the road. Um, that can be significant. Uh, some other concerns is security, the risk of being hacked, or your host eventually dropping support of older versions of PHP. Uh, you can try to circumvent um, these issues by finding long-term support partners, um, but it could just be delaying the inevitable, which is eventually having to do a migration. And then also the community, Drupal 7 community is getting smaller, and it'll likely just keep getting smaller in the future because newer people are going to be learning Drupal 10 or whatever the latest Drupal core version is. So over time, it's going to be harder to find developer support for your Drupal 7 site. Uh, the next option uh, could be to migrate to a static site. Uh, so the benefit is that it's inexpensive to host. Um, it's also fairly inexpensive to move from Drupal 7 to a static site for informational websites. Um, but some drawbacks are that you wouldn't um, be able to update content without developer support. Also your forms like search, user login, filters would not work without um, additional development work and you wouldn't be able to have authenticated users. So this is more of an option um, for Drupal sites that are strictly informational uh, and that only have anonymous users. Uh, the third option would be to migrate to Backdrop CMS. Uh, Backdrop is very similar to Drupal 7. Um, it's a fork of a release um, of Drupal before Drupal 8.0 was released. Um, so it's basically Drupal 7 with modern features and improvements. It's maintained by Drupal 7 core maintainers. Um, and it does have uh, some small community support, so it does um, receive security updates um, and bug fixes and enhancements. So if you have a very limited budget, this could be a viable option. Um, I would say that as long as all of your Drupal 7 contributed modules are available on Backdrop, um, then this could be an option for you. Um, if you use non-trivial Drupal 7 uh, contributed modules uh, that are not available on Backdrop, then this wouldn't be a good fit. Uh, we actually had a client that had a very limited budget, so we were trying to see if Backdrop could work for them, but they were using Commerce and Ubercart, which are very complex modules, and they don't have, um, they're not available on Backdrop, so it didn't make sense for that client. Um, and then some other things to just be aware of is the long-term sustainability and maintenance of Backdrop. It does have community support right now, but it's fairly small. Uh, so how long-term that support will be remains to be seen. And so it may eventually be that you're going to have to migrate from Backdrop to whatever the latest version of Drupal Core is at the time. And so that could be a bigger cost later down the road. And then last but not least, uh, you can migrate to Drupal 10. Um, you know, by migrating to Drupal 10, you are on a version of Drupal that receives updates, enhancements, security fixes. It's backed by the large Drupal community as well as governments and large organizations. Um, it's also officially rec recognized as a digital public good, um, which is great because it makes it easier um, to raise money and secure funding. So I think Sovereign Tech Fund actually um, gave $300,000 to the Drupal Association in funding. And so there's a lot of momentum behind Drupal to improve it and enhance it. Um, and so you would be on a secure version of Drupal that you know is going to continue to get better. Um, the, the drawback to migrating to Drupal 10 for a lot of people ends up being the cost because it can be costly to rebuild your site in Drupal 10 and migrate the data. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about in the upcoming section is how can you make that migration more efficient and cost effective so it can be a viable option for you. Thank you. Um, yes, like she said, so now we're going to talk about when you, if you make the decision to go to Drupal 10. That's the focus for the remaining slides. So um, these slides are, are focused primarily, you know, again, from our experience migrating various sites from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10, um, and not always from Drupal 7, uh, but just uh, migrating to Drupal 9 or 10 um, or above. So to, to have an effective migration, there's various 
things you need to do um, to you know, keep the costs down and to, re to receive a product that you're happy with. Um, one of the most important things is to audit your content. Um, so look at your Drupal 7 site and look at all the content types in there, look at all the various entity types. You may have content types, taxonomy types, media, user accounts, file, uh, files, etc. Um, and just because you have them doesn't mean you need to migrate them. Um, so one of the biggest mistakes people make is they say, I want my Drupal 7 site to be a Drupal 10 site, and that's not really what you should be doing. Um, Drupal 10 is not an upgrade of Drupal 7. It's, an, it's a, really a different platform. It's a migration, not an upgrade. So you should take this as an opportunity to evaluate what you need and look to migrate what you need. Um, so make a list of what you have, make it a prioritized list, um, and look into what's actually serving you and maybe what you want to change and take this as an opportunity to, again, narrow what you bring, um, but also potentially improve it. Um, because reduced scope reduces the cost. Um, now, there's various ways to reduce the scope. So I just mentioned one, which is you can uh, avoid migrating things that you don't need. Um, one example with one of our migrations we're working on, um, they have uh, like maybe a thousand user accounts and the client basically said, well, only, we only use 10 of them. Um, so in reality, they didn't need to migrate those user accounts. Um, you know, of course, you have to take a deeper look to, to make informed decisions. But um, you, you, you should look at those things and not just take everything for granted. Um, also, um, if you're trying to reduce the cost of your project, you can determine what can be done in-house and what cannot. A lot of Drupal 7 sites were built by people who started out as hobbyists, and maybe they continued maintaining their own Drupal 7 site. Uh, maybe you have one Drupal 7 person who may or may not consider themselves a Drupal developer, but they're the person in charge of the website, and maybe they do know HTML and CSS, and so they're comfortable theming Drupal 7, but they may not know Drupal 10, they may not be comfortable in the command line, etc. cetera. So um, we've had clients who decided their, they, their Drupal 7 developer can figure out theming in Drupal 10, but they can't figure out the migration, or at least they don't want to go through that effort. Um, so you can potentially partner with the development team and, and divide the work. You can, can keep the theming in-house, you can have them move the data for you, um, you know, you want to work with a development team that knows what they're doing, that's not always inexpensive, um, so you might just, again, limit the scope. Um, also, recognize that you might want, you might not get everything you had in Drupal 7. Um, again, I've uh, worked on projects, migration projects, where the client says, oh, well, in Drupal 7, I would, you know, check this box and I'd see that option and I can press a button to, I don't know, send a password reset email. In Drupal 10, I don't see that option. Give me that option. Um, it shouldn't simply be give me that option because I liked it and I'm used to it. Um, it should be a consideration of what is the effort to recreate that in Drupal 10. Does Drupal 10 have the same feature that Drupal 7 has out of the box? Uh, because Drupal, 7, Drupal 10 has a lot of new features that Drupal 7 did not have. And whenever we have these discussions, the clients are not asking us for these new features that Drupal 10 has. Right? They'll receive them, and their site will be better in a lot of ways, but they're not going to ask for them. Um, a lot of people make the mistake of focusing on what they might be losing, even if it ends up being something that, again, they're, they're used to, they're, they're familiar with and used to, but it might not actually be something um, that moves the needle day to day, right? It might not be something that's actually critical. Um, so, so work with your developers. Rather than being prescriptive, um, you should talk with them and say, this is a feature I like. What would it cost to migrate? Okay, let me prioritize it, right? Let me see if it's worth the cost. If you want to do some of the work in-house, again, the theming, some of the site building, and even some of the content migration, um, Potentially, you know, we're Debug Academy, we do training. Um, we sometimes, as part of our migration, we'll train their team, the client's team, for some of the work that they want to take over. So we might do two days of training to enable them to be stronger content editors, for example, um, or, you know, 
a little bit more comfortable in theming. Maybe they're a Drupal 7 themer and they want to do a bit of the theming in Drupal 10. So consider uh, reducing the scope that goes out to the vendors by getting training in-house and taking more of that work on yourself. The cost of training for a couple of days might um, you know, be a lot less expensive than the cost of having a vendor do some work that you would be able to do yourself after being trained. Maximizing efficiency. So this is a big one, and um, there's a handful of ways to do it, but um, I've seen, uh, again, very recently, a month ago, um, someone had attended one of our talks at DrupalCon and then got on a call with us for training. And the reason they wanted training was interesting. It's because they had hired a firm for migrating their website. And when they submitted, when they uh, posted their RFP, they received bids from maybe four companies. Uh, two or three of them were quite expensive, and one of them was very inexpensive. The, the more expensive ones were out of budget, so they went with the less expensive one. And when I was talking to these people about training, they said they really loved the two of the more expensive options. They were great, they sounded like they really knew what they were doing, but they were simply out of budget. And they went with the less expensive one. Um, the less expensive company ended up, um, it, it was a team that had an you know, offshore team, they were outsourcing the work um, to their you know, offshore developers. And their Drupal core itself, a lot of the contributions come from offshore developers, so this is not a comment on offshore developers. You can have offshore developers who are experts, who are you know, better than what you'll find here. Um, but with that said, in this case, that was not the case. Um, so they brought a bunch of inexpensive offshore developers who may have been experienced with programming in general, but were not experienced with Drupal. And these people did a very bad job with the migration overall. They did migrate from Drupal 7 to 9 or 10. They did not use best practices. The quality of the data and the end result was poor. These people did not know, know anything about Drupal before starting the work. Um, maybe the person who sold or won the RFP did know, but the actual developers who worked on it did not. And so the reason they came to us for training was because they had already signed the contract, they couldn't get out of it, they were going to let these people finish the entire project and after they finish it, they planned on fixing it themselves. So they wanted us to train them because that was less expensive than hiring the experts. Um, and so, you know, we're still in conversations with them about that, but we plan on doing some custom training to enable them to clean up the work. Um, but all in all, it would have been less expensive for them to go with the more expensive option rather than the less expensive option and, you know, tying their hands behind their backs for the next six to 12 months to rework the migrated project. It's also much harder to fix a project after it's been migrated. It's much easier to do it right the first time. So when we talk about maximizing efficiency, it's not necessarily you know, picking the less expensive option. It's often picking the more expensive per person option. So you might uh, hire a team of experts. It might just be one expert, but it might be one to three experts, a you know, small team. Um, and you sometimes get some you know, efficiencies gained there because they often need less management, right? If someone really knows what they're doing, obviously it varies person to person, but if someone really knows what they're doing, um, you, you can sometimes save on some of the management overhead um, and they can, um, you know, execute in a more reliable way. Um, now, this, again, this really is, is at the individual developer level, more so than it might be at the company level. If you hire a company, you might not know exactly who's on your project. So when you're going for this approach, when you maybe are a bit resource constrained, you want to do your best to know exactly who's going to work on your project when you're hiring them. Right? If you do the RFP process, see if you can find, have conversations potentially even with the, the technical lead of your project. And um, try to get a commitment from the, from the company that that's actually going to be the person who works on your project. Um, now, with this, with this approach, um, so we say expert-led agile development process is ideal. So with the migration, you're going to want to use some sort of agile approach, um, which, you know, the Agile Man Manifesto, it's all about um, showing updates frequently, um, prioritizing, you know, higher value work, uh, prioritizing frequent releases, prioritizing interactions. So it's, 
there are, very, there are different flavors of Agile. Um, but uh, as you'll see in an upcoming slide, um, when we do our, our work, we typically have one to two developers doing a Drupal 7 migration. And um, we often are self-managed, right? We, but that involves a lot of communication with the client. Um, and um, again, it depends on the individual. But um, it can, um, we prioritize our work with the client, we get approval with the client regularly. And um, it doesn't necessarily need to be two week sprint cycles with, with daily stand-ups. Um, but it's more about um, an appropriate amount of communication so that all parties know what is being done, where the progress is, what remains, what's in scope, what's out of scope, and um, regularly uh, discussing, um, having regular discussions to fill in any gaps um, and to review progress and to make changes. So how do you pick a partner? How do you choose who to work with? Um, again, you want to try to talk to the people who will actually work on the project and try to get them to explain how they're going to do the work. Because um, you might get people who just say, we're experts, we're really great, you know, we've done a lot of big projects. Try to get them to walk you through, okay, how are you going to set up a migration? How are you going to run it? See if they know the names of the tools. See if they know, you know, the, the terminology. Um, take notes on what they say and maybe get a second opinion, um, do some research, see if it lines up with what you find out there. Um, because again, sometimes you'll get some really smart people who haven't done Drupal before and they just think, you know, a website's a website. I'm a, I'm a strong software developer. I can pick up Drupal and figure out the migration. Um, that's not a low budget way to do things, right? They're going to try to learn on your dime, but a migration is not the best time to do that. Um, also, you can do a trial phase, um, so you can have them, uh, if, if they're setting up a migration for you know, all your content types, all your users, etc., um, maybe talk to the developer and, and divide the work into milestones and have a system where you are not contractually obligated to go through with the whole thing after the first milestone. Right? So make the first milestone be noteworthy, make it be something that you can test and you know, thoroughly evaluate. Again, this is something we typically do on our projects. Um, we've divided our work into milestones, which they're not milestones the client could have come up with themselves because they don't know the dependencies. But working with them, we make proposals along the lines of, okay, we'll migrate users first, followed by this content type. This content type has a dependency on the following, so we might need to bring that in too. And we'll call that the first milestone because that's the first time you'll be able to look at something substantial. Um, and then we broke out the overall project into various milestones. And once the first milestone is done and paid for and reviewed, the client can decide whether they want to continue with us for the rest of the work. And which version do you need to migrate to? Again, this is a question you can ask the vendor, see if they already know the answer. Um, because it's not always the latest version. Depending on when you do the migration, the answer is going to be different. We did migration six months ago, and at the time, even though Drupal 10 had been out for a long time, the right answer was Drupal 9. Because various migration modules were stable for Drupal 9, um, there are various roll-up modules which you know, uh, consolidate a lot of patches and whatnot that were also available for Drupal 9. So for that project, it made sense to migrate from 7 straight to 9, and after the migration finished, to upgrade to 10. Right, so a lot of people might think we, go, we should go from 7 to 10 we don't want to migrate from 7 to 9 and then migrate from 9 to 10. It's not a migration from 9 to 10. It's an upgrade. 7 to 8 was a rewrite. Drupal 8 is very different from Drupal 7. However, Drupal 9 is not very different from Drupal 8. Drupal 10 is not very different from Drupal 9, and so on. 8 to 9 is an upgrade. 9 to 10 is an upgrade, and so on. So um, it can make more sense. It can be more cost effective to migrate from 7 to the current version minus one, and then to do an upgrade after that. Um, you would have to reassess this at the time your migration starts. Drupal 11 came out maybe two weeks ago. If I were to start a migration today, and I felt the migration could be completed in a few months, I would go to 10, and then I would upgrade. If maybe the migration would take much longer than that, if I was doing a full rebuild followed by a migration, maybe I would go straight to 11. So it really depends on the timeline. Okay, so specific examples from some of the migration projects we've done. 
So when I talk about streamlined agile um, to lower the overhead, um, remember there's different, a lot of different flavors of agile. Um, in this case, we were working on the project ourselves, really, and you know we're both very experienced uh, developers, and so. Um, we decided to forego the daily stand-ups and um, manage the project ourselves with, uh, with regular meetings with the client. Um, and what we did was we just used a simple GitHub issue queue, we, with, you can see the check boxes here, um, where any developer can jump in and check whatever box is appropriate. You can see in progress, needs detail, high priority, etc. You can see a priority number, we have priority five, estimate two, etc. And um, the way we did it is if I was going to look into something, I'd just check in progress. And that way if someone else looks through the list and sees something in progress, they're not going to work on the same thing. Um, and once I dig into it, if I find we don't have enough information and we need to talk to the client, we would check needs detail. And that would um, essentially prompt us that we need a meeting with the client tomorrow or at least an email first to discuss whatever needs detail. Um, so for this, this approach worked really well with us. Again, with the periodic meetings with the client, we would um, show them this list. This wasn't only something that we could see. We would show them the full list um, and ask them, you know, does it look like anything is missing? And um, they would add things to the list. You can see these two examples in particular. Um, these are issues reported by the client. Sidebars are not showing up in these review draft. The past issue page order is incorrect. Um, and this is because when you're in, in this model, right, it was a lower budget Drupal 7 to 10 migration. Um, and it was for actually a government agency that's, you know, uh, uh, a high profile site. Um, but nonetheless, they had a lot of websites and we were migrating two of them for them. Um, so in this case, um, the model we use, which I believe is referenced on an upcoming slide, is that we audited the Drupal 7 sites for them because they didn't have any in-house expert who could tell us what the requirements were or could tell us what the scope was. So we are also comfortable in Drupal 7. We dug through, we found all the requirements we could find, showed them the list, did the migration, and then we asked them to do some thorough testing. And they did the testing side by side and they pointed out, oh, here's things in Drupal 7 we never told you about that are not behaving the same way as they are in Drupal 10. And that was a perfectly fine approach because we were operating in an agile manner. We allocated time to respond to their feedback, et cetera. So um, they did that testing. We learned about you know, some custom PHP sorting logic that we then recreated in Drupal 10 and so on. Um, ultimately, we were able to launch both sites within the scheduled time and within budget. Um, so one of these projects was a multi-site. Um, or one of the migration projects we've done was a multi-site um, in Drupal 7. And um, you know, it was multiple Drupal 7 sites in the same code base. So a multi-site means they all share the same code, but they may have different databases. In this case, they had different databases with a few exceptions. Um, and, so, and they also had some entity types that were appropriate for Drupal 7, but maybe not for Drupal 10 such as field collections. In Drupal 7, field collections was very popular. In Drupal 10, paragraphs or potentially a custom entity type or you know, a custom field type, um, any one of those could be alternatives to field collections. And that's why you want to go with someone who is an experienced Drupalist because they're going to migrate field collections to field collections if they haven't heard about it. Um, so what did we do to lower the cost of the multi-site migration? We had one developer work on all of the different multi-sites in parallel because the, when you make a site a multi-site, there's usually a reason you're doing that. They usually have a lot in common. They might have the same modules, they might have some of the same content types, and so on. So instead of having two developers working on two sites, we had one developer work on both sites um, in terms of wiring up the migration. And whenever, and whenever they did something on one site, they would check, does the other site have the same feature? If so, I'm going to export the configuration for this migration. I'm going to copy it to the other multi-site and tweak it as needed. Um, so basically, the first site, maybe one task might take three hours. And then for the second site, it might take 15 minutes. You know, so we would save a lot of time on the second site. And you know, the developers 
uh, we're comfortable with both Drupal 7 and 10, so that also ends up making things a lot more efficient. And the develop because they're comfortable with Drupal 7, we're able to dig into the Drupal 7 site directly, you know, without skipping a beat. Right? I can use Drush here. I can use Drush there. I can dig into the views settings, um, and didn't require too much investigation to figure out how things were working. Um, Another project, uh, we were asked to migrate one Drupal 7 site and to split it into multiple sites on the other side. And it wasn't just a matter of take some content, put it here, some content, put it there. In addition to that, they wanted us to rewrite content. So for example, they had text fields that said the author is, you know, Mr. So-and-so and Mrs. So-and-so. And um, they wanted us to split that into potentially different content types or different taxonomy types. Um, so we were able to write some custom logic to take that text field, split it on special keywords like and or comma, et cetera, uh, convert it to a different field type taxonomy, create those taxonomy terms. And we did this all during the migration. Um, there was also, because they were doing this through text fields, we were able to look for duplicated text and you know, dedupe the content as part of the migration. Um, and there were various things that in Drupal 7 were not built with best practice. Um, for example, they used field collections with an image field and then a caption text field. Um, in Drupal 10, the right way to do that would be media type, an image media type with, an, with a caption. Um, so we were able to, uh, even though the client told us, just migrate field collections to paragraphs, we were able to look at the content and say, well, I know that paragraphs is the modern equivalent of field collections, but really this looks like it should be a media type. And we discussed it with them, they agreed, and so we transformed it to a different entity type. So how do we try to bring the costs down for them? Again, they had a very limited budget, and the way that they decided to bring the costs down was they only had us do the data migration. So we created the content types for them, we created the media types for them, we migrated the data, but we didn't build the site for them. We didn't do the views, we didn't do the theming at all. Um, that was all on them. We didn't do the display modes. All we did is we took the data from Drupal 7, reformatted, cleaned it up, split it to two sites, and gave them nice shiny content types that were you know, uh, well-built, uh, best practices all around. Um, and from there, they took over theming. Um, so that drastically reduced the cost of the project, reduced the timeline, of course, um, and uh, for this, uh, we also did some training for them because they were comfortable in Drupal 7. So we trained them to make sure they were going to theme the Drupal 10 site in the right, uh, in an appropriate way. Um, again, they were not beginners in Drupal 7, so it only took a couple of days of training. We gave them the slides and the video recording so that they could go back and review it anytime. Uh, again, that drastically reduced the cost. And we went from one site to multiple. So on the other end, we decided to go with the multi-site architecture so that the ongoing maintenance would be a bit easier as well. Um, and part of that, we also trained them in composers so they can do updates themselves so they wouldn't have to rely on vendors for security updates either. So to reduce the cost and increase productivity, some of the takeaways. Again, try to analyze and create a prioritized list of features and content that must be migrated, as opposed to what would be a nice to have. Um, work with your developer to understand how complicated are all of these different things, and when you have that information, use it to determine what scope could and should be trimmed. Now, you don't need to trim scope for no reason. Sometimes something is very simple. You know, maybe it's not so important, but it's very simple. Um, you know, like our client was like uh, talking about migrating comments. He was like, you don't need to migrate the author of the comment. And we were telling him, well, that actually requires no extra work. So if you, you know, if you don't mind, we will do that and we won't charge you extra for it. Right? So you don't need to trim scope unnecessarily, but that should be a conversation with the developers. Um, determine what you can do in-house versus what you need um, to you know, outsource or uh, to work with a partner on. Um, if you want to do some of the work in-house, consider training um, to ramp up your abilities to do more in-house. Um, 
And one thing I think I might have not said explicitly, sometimes even if you want to bring something over, if there are not too many of that thing, so for example, you might have a content type with only 10 nodes. Um, in some cases, it might make more sense to just manually recreate it on the other side. Um, so in terms of trim scope, it could be that you trim something from the migration, but that doesn't necessarily mean you lose it from the new site, right? You can still manually input it if that makes sense. Um, and again, finally, hire a smaller team. It could even be one person. Uh, but hire a smaller team. The most important thing is that the work is led by someone who really knows what they're doing, um, because that will lead to better outcomes and a better timeline. Again, we mentioned various courses. We are an Acquia certified migration partner. Um, so if you have a Drupal 7 migration project that you're looking for help with, we're wrapping some up now. You know, we'd be more than happy to talk with you. Um, again, we're a very small team, five people in the whole company, so you'll know who you're working with. And um, you know, we are very efficient, effective, and at the end of the day, we'll give you advice for free. You know, we'll point you in the right direction. Um, so this QR code just takes you to essentially an info form for our migration services. Um, feel free to fill it out, debugacademy.com in general for uh, looking at our courses and our various services. Um, again, we do migrations, we do consulting, general development, and training. Um, I hope you got some, some benefits out of this. If you have any questions, we're more than happy to answer. Um, but thank you all. I know it's the last session of the day on the last day, so I appreciate you all showing up for it. <laughs> thank you.